I'm going to uh, share with you a uh, document, actually a letter written by uh, Chief John Ross of the Cherokee Nation, dated um, June 21st, 1836. And in this, uh, in this letter, uh, which was addressed to the United States Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, Ross denounces the Treaty of Nui Chota of 1835 that was signed by a delegation led by the Ridge Party. Ross refers to it as a pretended treaty and explains that the government uh, is not legitimate uh, and claims that it's supported, it was supportive of the majority of the nation, which it was not. Ross, Ross sets forth reasons against removal of the Cherokee people to lands west of the Mississippi and defends himself against various accusations, especially those made by John F. Shermerhorn, U.S. Commissioner. Ross's letter uh, includes a memorial, which is what I'm going to read today, that was submitted to Congress by a Cherokee delegation led personally by Ross. The memorial outlines the history of agreements between the United States and the Cherokees in objection uh, to activities of Georgia, uh, the state of Georgia against the Cherokee Nation and its people. Significant evidence of oppression, mistreatment are offered as uh, evidence of Georgia overstepping its legitimate authority. The delegation also protested the Treaty of Nui Chota. Red Clay Council Ground, Cherokee Nation, September 28, 1836. It is well known that for a number of years we have been harassed by a series of vexations which, is, which it is deemed necessary, unnecessary to recite in detail, but the evidence of which our delegation will be prepared to furnish. With a view to bringing our troubles to a close, a delegation was appointed on the 23rd of October, 1835 by the General Council of the Cherokee Nation, clothed with the full powers to enter into arrangements with the government of the United States and for the final adjustment of our existing difficulties. The delegation, failing to effect an agreement with the United States Commissioner, then in the nation, proceeded agreeably to their instructions to, the, to Washington City for the purpose of negotiating a treaty with the authorities of the United States. After their departure, the delegation, a contract was made by John F. Shermerhorn and certain individual Cherokees purporting to be a treaty concluded at Nui Chota in the state of Georgia on the 29th day of December, 1835, by General William Carroll and John F. Shermerhorn, commissioners on the part of the United States, and the chiefs, headmen, and people of the Cherokee tribes of Indians. A spurious delegation in violation of special injunction of the, Cher of the General Council of the Cherokee Nation proceeded to Washington, D.C. with this pretended treaty and by false and fraudulent representations supplanted in the favor of the government the legal alterations of its provisions, the recognition of the United States government. And now it is presented to us as a treaty ratified by the Senate and approved by President Andrew Jackson and our acquiescence in its requirements demanded under the sanction and displeasure of the United States and the threat of summary compulsion in case of refusal. It comes to us not through our legitimate authorities, the known and usual medium communicated between the government of the United States and our nation, but through the agency of a complication of powers, civil and military. By the stipulations of this in instrument, we are despoiled of our private possessions, the indefeasible property of individuals. We are stripped of every attribute of freedom and eligibility for our self-defense. Our property may be plundered before our eyes. Violence may be committed on our persons. Even our lives may be taken away, and there is none to regard our complaints. We are denationalized. We are disenfranchised. We are deprived of membership in the human family. We have neither land nor home nor resting place that can be called our own. And this is affected by the provisions of a compact which assumes the venerated and sacred appellation of a treaty. We are overwhelmed. Our hearts are sickened. Our utterance is paralyzed when we reflect on the condition in which we are placed by the audacious practices of unprincipled men who have managed their stratagems with so much dexterity as to impose the government of the United States in the face of our earnest, solemn, and reiterated protests. The instrument in question is not an act of our nation. 
and we are not parties to its covenants. It is not conceived by the sanction of our people. The makers of it sustain no office nor appointment in the nation under the designation of chiefs, headmen, or any other title by which they hold or could acquire authority to assume the reins of power of government and to make the bargain and sale of our rights, our possessions, and our common country. And we are constrained solemnly to declare that we cannot but contemplate the enforcement of the stipulations of this instrument upon us against our consent as an act of injustice and oppression, which we are persuaded and never, and never knowingly by counterance the government of the people of the United States, nor can we believe it to be the design of these honorable and high-minded individuals who stand at the head of government to bind a whole nation by the acts of a few unauthorized individuals. And therefore, we, the parties to be affected by the result, appeal with confidence to the justice, the magnanimity, and the compassion of your honorable bodies and your enforcement upon us, the provisions of a compact in the formation of which we had no agency. In truth, our cause is your very own. It is the cause of liberty and justice. It is based upon your own principles, which we have learned from yourselves, for which we have glorified to count your George Washington and Thomas Jefferson as our great teachers. We have read their communications to us with veneration. We have practiced their precepts with success. And the result of this is manifest. The wildness of the forest has given place to comfortable dwellings and cultivated fields stocked with various domesticated animals. Mental culture, industrious habits, domestic enjoyments have succeeded the rudeness of the savage state. In conclusion, we commend your confidence and favor. Our well-beloved and trustworthy brethren, fellow citizens John Ross, Principal Chief, Richard Taylor, Samuel Gunter, John Bing, George Sanders, Walter Adair, Stephen Foreman, and Kalahastahi are clothed with the full powers to adjust our existing difficulties by treaty arrangements with the United States by which our destruction may be averted. Impediments to the advancement of our people removed and the existence perpetuated as a living monument to testify to the posterity of honor, the magnanimity, the generosity of the United States. As your memorialist, as in duty bound, ever I pray, signed John Ross.